Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nellie Stedham, and I'm a research assistant for the Education and Outreach Corps at the University of Vermont Center on Rural Addiction. I'm here with Jenny Noel, Outreach Manager, who will be helping run this webinar. Thank you for joining us today. The Community Rounds Workshop Series is a live webinar series held monthly by the UVM Center on Rural Addiction to provide opportunities for health professionals and community partners to learn and ask questions. We discuss topics related to science-based best practices for substance use disorders. Today's session will be unique as we have three presenters who will all present for 30 minutes with time set aside at the end for questions. Dr. Kelly will present first on one-stop shopping for recovery, rationale and research on peer recovery community centers. Dr. Deppman will follow and present on assertively linking people to care, building peer recovery coach program in the emergency department. Finally, Liza Ryan will present on peer recovery coaching, the impact. Before today's session, I'd like to go over a couple of reminders. We encourage you to ask questions, so feel free to enter them into the Q&A box during the session, which can be found at the bottom of your screen, as shown by the red marker. We will review them during the Q&A period at the end. If you need to step away before the Q&A period, this session is being recorded and will be delivered, along with the slides, to your mailbox by next Wednesday. If we run out of time for all questions, we will follow up with you via email. At the end of the session, a poll will be shared in the last two minutes to assist us with evaluation. We'd love for you to stay on to complete that poll. It will appear in the middle of your screen when launched. If people are comfortable, please use the chat box to introduce yourself to the group by sharing your name and organization and what community you are coming from. Be sure to select panelists and attendees when you use the chat feature so your peers can connect with you. We also recommend that you choose speaker view during the webinar, so you can only see the presenter speaking and not the other panelists. We're very excited to offer live captioning at today's event. To access the captions, please go to the link inserted in the chat today. Continuing education credits are available for those who attend the session live. We will share the link in the chat box during the session for instructions on how to claim your credits. You will also get instructions via email when you receive the recording and slides. If you have questions, you can contact us at cora at uvm.edu. We, we do ask that you claim these credits within 30 days of the live webinar. There are no disclosures for this community round session and all potential conflicts of interest have been resolved. If you have any questions regarding the Zoom platform, please use the chat box and we will try our best to resolve any problems. All right, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. John F. Kelly from the Recovery Research Institute. He is the Elizabeth R. Spallen Professor of Psychiatry and Addiction Medicine at Harvard Medical School, the first endowed professor in addiction medicine at Harvard. He is also the founder and director of the Recovery Research Institute at the Massachusetts General Hospital the Associate Director of the Center for, uh, for Addiction Medicine at MassGen, and the Program Director of the Addiction Recovery Management Service. Dr. Kelly is a former president of the American Psychological Association's Society of Addiction and Psychology, and is a fellow of the APA and a diplomat of the American Board of Professional Psychology. He has served as a... Um, as a consultant to US federal agencies and non-federal institutions, as well as foreign governments in the United Nations. Dr. Kelly has published over 200 peer reviewed articles, reviews, chapters, and books in the field of addiction medicine, and was an author on the US Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health. His clinical and research work has focused on addiction treatment and the recovery process, mechanisms of behavioral change, and reducing stigma and discrimination among individuals suffering from addiction. We're very excited he's able to join us today to share some of his research. Thank you, Nelly. Um, I hope you all can hear me okay and can see these slides okay. 
Um, thanks for the very warm welcome and introduction. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity um, uh, and invitation to be here with you all this morning, um, talking about this very important and growing area of peer recovery support centers and recovery coaching, et cetera. Um, it's an exciting area, I think, in our field um, because it has, I think it has great potential to connect the dots um, uh, in, a, in a system of care that we can address these endemic problems related to opioids, alcohol, amphetamine, methamphetamine, et cetera, uh, that we are constantly, it seems, suffering under. Um, I uh, have entitled the topic uh, of the talk today, my title is One Stop Shopping for Recovery. And, and you'll get the picture, I think, of, of why it is one stop shopping, or at least intended to be so. Um, this is a kind of roadmap of where I'm going to take you in the next 25 minutes. I'll just give you a little bit of um, definition of what recover, peer recovery community centers are, why did they grow and emerge, how they might work, and what do we know actually from the preliminary data that's been uh, collected on how they actually confer benefit and what degree of benefit. So recovery community centers, as many of you know, are designed to provide locatable uh, sources of recovery capital at the community level uh, beyond the clinical setting. So these are designed to provide access to peers in a rich social milieu with people with lived experience who provide not just that peer support, but also provide tangible instrumental support by way of access to and linkages to housing, to jobs, to training, to a variety of other different services, uh, as I mentioned. They often get confused with other kinds of recovery support services, including residential services. They are not residential uh, entities. Um, they are not sober living environments. They're not treatment facilities. They're not 12 step clubhouses, or they're not drop in clinical centers. Okay. And they're often confused with those kinds of things. They provide, as I mentioned, a source of recovery capital at the community level. Um, and they celebrate all pathways to recovery. This is the intention. And we have found, in fact, that, that that's largely true, is that um, these centers do provide a, uh, an agnostic, if you will, uh, approach to recovery and celebrate any and all means uh, uh, necessary to achieve and sustain remission and recovery from substance use disorders. Um, and I think, you know, the, the access to recovery capital and the social milieu is, is designed to engage people, of course, through uh, access and exposure and engagement with people with lived experience who have had addiction and found a way out uh, of it. Uh, and I think many of these um, active ingredients that are um, reported by people in recovery themselves to be operating, I think are true and are probably stimulated and, and facilitated by engagement in recovery community centers. And these include connection, providing hope and optimism, optimism, providing a sense of positive social identity and self-esteem, provide a sense of meaning and purpose and empower people to make the changes that they need by providing access to recovery capital. Now, of course, when we're talking about uh, rural settings, uh, we face different challenges, um, most notably in terms of access. So obviously some of these barriers include transportation, but also workforce and service availability, the issue of privacy, and then the peer support network itself in terms of the just the sheer number of people that may be uh, around at these centers. Um, obviously with rural, um, rural uh, based RCCs, there's the issue of access and transportation, which means that there's longer travel duration um, we do know that a strong predictor of utilization is accessibility. This is across the board in healthcare, um, as well as um, um, things like physical fitness as well. Um, limited access to public transportation, financial burden of public and private transportation means it costs more to get to these centers um, and a higher chance of, of accidents just by virtue of the fact that there's longer distances involved. Um, in terms of workforce and services, there's also a lower, lower quorum number of people in these uh, recovery uh, centers, which means uh, there's fewer people available to run them and to provide the number of services that may be available in more urban centers. Um, there may be fewer recoveries or, or personnel at the centers that provide that kind of robust sense of community, which can be so buoyant 
uh, for people to have to be exposed to and have access to that can really instill hope that change is possible. So there may be few of those role models around. Um, there could be financial uh, implications, depending on how the, the, the RCCs are funded, um, uh, in terms of, again, just providing the, 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 the resources that can fund them versus whether they're coming from the state funding, regardless of utilization. Um, and then certain services may not be offered or offered in lower uh, uh, quantity and or quality. The quality may be diminished just by virtue of the fact that uh, there may not be as many people um, there may be lower internet access or low uh, quality uh, internet access and Wi-Fi availability in some areas. Um, privacy is another issue. Uh, smaller communities provide less anonymity, of course. Um, everybody uh, may know everybody else's business in smaller communities. And this issue of stigma may inhibit people seeking help, utilizing uh, the services, even when they're in recovery and have already resolved a significant drug or alcohol problem, we have found that people still suffer from um, a number of different um, uh, discriminations, um, despite being many years into recovery. Uh, in terms of peer networks, uh, smaller recovery communities, as I mentioned, uh, there's group meetings and other community uh, events may also be smaller. And this raises the question of whether there, there is a kind of a needed quorum or, or threshold of of individuals that need to be present to provide um, kind of for, for those therapeutic factors to be fully realized. That's, a, that's an empirical question that we don't really know the answer to. Certainly some is better than none. We don't know exactly how many people or what the, what the, what the you know, kind of quorum should be in terms of um, producing a, a maximum or, or fully or full therapeutic benefit. Also in terms of peer networks, um, uh, there may be in the recovery uh, rural areas, uh, just because of the fewer numbers, it may mean that other subgroups within the recovery population, like LGBTQ, um, other racial ethnic groups or veterans, may not find the kinds of uh, subgroup support that uh, attend to their specific needs uh, that may be available in urban areas. And of course, people may have to travel long distances um, to, to enter treatment programs and become isolated from the network that they may develop uh, at their recovery support center. So why did they emerge and grow? I think there's been an increased recognition of the, the time it takes for people to achieve a stable remission. And these are data um, are put together here in this timeline from multiple sources, prospective, retrospective epidemiological studies, but it really highlights the timeline in terms of uh, how long it takes to achieve remission with people with addiction. These are severe SUD uh, people um, who have severe SUD, kind of people that we see in specialty care, um, who take about eight years and about four to five treatment episodes before reaching one year of stable remission. Uh, that's 12 months of full sustained remission without symptoms. Uh, so that's quite a long time. Um, and uh, what's also noteworthy here on the right-hand side, you can see that even after people achieve um, that full sustained remission, that 12 months without symptoms, it can still take another four to five years before the risk of reinstatement of the disorder or meeting criteria for the disorder in the following year drops below 15%. Why 15%? Because 15% is the annual risk for meeting criteria for a any type of alcohol or drug use disorder in the general population. To be no more likely therefore than anybody else in the general population of meeting criteria for a substance use disorder in the following year, if you've already had it, takes four to five years of continuous remission. So it remains the risk for reinstatement of meeting criteria remains elevated for that first four to five year period. Um, and this creates a, a, a timeline of course of elevated risk as well as a bumpy road into remission. The good news is that about 75% from national estimates, about 75% of people who meet criteria for a substance use disorder will eventually achieve remission from it. It's a good prognosis disorder. Um, I think an important question is, that's come along for the field, is can we speed this up, right? Is this just an inexorable course of the illness or is there something we can actually do 
to shorten the time to full sustained remission, to shorten the time to stable remission? I think the answer is yes. Um, I liken, uh, I often use this metaphor of a burning building. You know, we, we're, we're at this 50 year milestone right now here in 2021, since the declaration of the war on drugs in 1971. What have we learned? What have we done in 50 years in addressing these endemic problems? I think one of the things we've done very well is we've recognized there is an emergency situation. There is a building on fire, as it were. We've learned to put the fire out. We know how to stabilize, detoxify, and uh, provide medications for people or provide some kind of short-term stabilization and treatment, usually 12 weeks. Um, that's pretty much the way that treatments have been tested. Uh, and we've done a good job providing that very short-term, critical, absolutely critical uh, piece of the puzzle here in terms of putting out the fire. Where we've done a less good job is providing, once the fire is out, is providing the building materials that people need to refit their life, to rebuild their life, and also, very importantly, providing the building permits that people need to be able to start building. Oftentimes, people have felony convictions related to their drug use, which close doors, which prevent them from accessing or beginning that building process that they really need to start because of prior criminal convictions. And so this is a very important legislative piece that we need to address to help people uh, achieve um, uh, that, get that building permit so they can start accessing the building materials and refit their life, refit their, uh, the building, as it were, in terms of moving forwards in their life. And I think if we do this, if we provide access to these other pieces, not just addressing the clinical pathology, but, deter but helping people to access these, their other needs, the things that they need in terms of social capital, access to live pe peers with lived experience who can provide role modeling and support, but also the other tangible things that they need, building materials and building permits. What's noteworthy is that when you look at now what NIDA now um, uh, uh, states are components of comprehensive drug addiction treatment, um, I think it's expanded from the usual clinical uh, services which are addressing clinical pathology, which are mostly in the middle here, to these extra services which are addressing these other factors outside of the, of the clinical pathology realm per se, but more to do with vocational, educational, um, legal, all the other things that people need addressed to remove, to reduce that biobehavioral stress, which undermines a lot of the recovery uh, potential. We do know in terms of how these things might work, therefore, that addressing these so-called social determinants of health or recovery capital needs, that we can help reduce that burden of biobehavioral stress and instill hope among those in early recovery, that they can access these building materials and get a building permit so they can actually start to progress in their life. Now, doing so, probably mitigates what we know to be this extra additional hypersensitivity to stress early in recovery. This is a consequence of the, just the neurophysiological impact of chronic exposure to drugs and alcohol over many years, which people often suffer. Oftentimes also, not just is there a hypersensitivity to stress, but also a lowered capacity to experience normal levels of reward. Imagine that combination. You're hypersensitive to stress and you can't experience the same levels of reward that you once used to or that other people can. And so that combination tends to trip people up, leads them back into substance use. So providing um, access to these resources and can instill hope and, and help mitigate that stress. Um, and this just shows here um, just the, 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 the course of, of what happens early in recovery as people start to change their substance use behavior. There's usually a recognition that the fire, there's a fire in the building. There's an alarm. There's something that I need to do to change my drug use. Uh, there's resistance. I want to cut down. I want to stop. I want to change this behavior. And there's resistance, resistance, and resistance, but people can only hold on for so long without the requisite supports in place over time. That leads to exhaustion in the organism, which can then uh, uh, lead to reinstatement. Now, we know that addiction, of course, is a complex multifactorial process. We also know that recovery is a dynamic and complex process. And it's really captured in, again, like, just like addiction, by these many facets. 
the, our biology, as well as the interaction dynamically over time with the environment. And importantly, I think, access to what we call recovery capital. This includes internal recovery capital. These will be things like optimism, hope, that I can get better, self-esteem, meaning and purpose, empowerment, those things I mentioned, which are active ingredients on the internal level, but also the external services that people need, jobs, housing, education, employment, access to healthcare, which we do know already that they change the brain in the same way. They can accelerate these positive adaptive changes in the brain and produce recovery. So in terms of the mechanisms then, we know that these mechanisms work, that RCCs work, by helping to reduce that biobehavioral stress to upregulate these dopamine receptors in the brain that can help people perceive normal levels of reward by providing access to recovery capital and thereby enhancing the rates of longer term stable remission and enhanced quality of life. So what do we know? That's conceptually then um, how these things may work. What do we know about their actual impact? Well. We know very little from an empirical standpoint right now. We just finished a couple of years ago, we finished the first ever uh, systematic study of recovery community centers that was sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. And we've published now um, several reports on these initial data. And we are currently uh, conducting more research and funding more research um, through a grant that we have from NIDA, which is expanding the research infrastructure on these entities around the country. Um, but we had three aims in this initial investigation, which was to survey staff and directors at the recovery community centers across New England. This included Vermont, uh, Maine, all the New England states, as well as New York State. We did a cross-sectional survey also of existing RCC participants. And then we did a longitudinal investigation of new participants who were attending the centers for the first time in the first six months of recovery. And we followed them just up, uh, up to three months to look at what they were using and how they benefited. So what did we find in terms of the directors? And, and by the way, you can have access to any of these papers, happy to send them to you, as well as you can have these slides. Um, we found that, uh, uh, of course, we had centers from Vermont and, and the landscape has changed actually in just ter in terms of the sheer numbers of these centers uh, in the last five years or so. For example, in Massachusetts, at the time we did the study, there were just five centers. Now there are approximately 40 centers uh, in Massachusetts and they're growing rapidly. Um, so you can see how the landscape is changing just in terms of the sheer number of these uh, centers. Um, but we found that um, they've been operating for about nine years on average, mostly in urban and suburban locations, fewer in rural areas, um, and most were quickly accessible uh, within 15 minutes um, of, uh, um, of where people uh, lived. Uh, Senate directors were mostly female, uh, slightly more female, I think about 60, 40, uh, with uh, primary drug histories of alcohol, cocaine, and opioids. Um, interestingly, most, nearly all, but not all uh, directors and staff were in recovery themselves, which I think is interesting. Um, most of the, according to the directors, most of the visitors at the centers were male, white, unemployed, and criminal justice involved. Overall, um, there tended to be a high degree of clinical pathology present and a low degree of recovery capital that people had at starting when they started accessing the centers. These were the referral sources, mostly self-referred, but also a large number from treatment, some from criminal justice, um, and some from other uh, resources. I think what's interesting here um, is looking at uh, the utilization by people in recovery. You can see that as you would expect that a large number of uh, the census people using the centers um, were in the early stages of recovery. You can see here about 31% in the first six months, 17% six months to one year. But if you also look, uh, there's also a large number who in that one to five year period and even 20% that had five or more years. Uh, but you can see that, again, that relative instability period from one to five years, as I mentioned, people utilizing these centers uh, for various uh, needs. The majority of people using the centers, the primary drugs were alcohol and opioids, as you can see, but it varied a lot across centers. Many of these centers were in Vermont. Uh, alcohol and opioids tended to be the primary drugs that people uh, had in their histories um, who were using the centers. 
Now look at the smorgasbord here of uh, the kinds of things that these centers offered. A variety, a large variety of, of uh, activities. And um, most of them were centered around the social milieu, the social groups through all recovery meetings, other kinds of group meetings and group support, but as well as um, things like Narcan uh, administration training and medication assisted treatment support, um, employment services, housing assistance, and every, every single one of them focused on recreation, uh, which was very important. A um, couple of other things I'll mention. Uh, one is the cross-sectional results. So this was a paper that we published looking at the um, who was using the centers um, in, um, in a sample of 336 people. We asked about their own experiences with the centers, their characteristics, and this is what we found. Excuse me. Um, we found about half were, were women who, who participated in this survey. Um, um, the average age was about 41 years old. Um, I think of note, about a quarter identified as LGBTQ. So it may be that these centers are pro providing a particularly warm and engaging and accepting atmosphere um, for LGBTQ persons uh, who we do know tend to be more um, stigmatized, uh, have this kind of double stigma. So that's very encouraging. Um, also, uh, mostly white in, in this sample, um, about 11% Hispanic. Um, high school or lower uh, in terms of education was about half. Low income, um, that was uh, pretty much across the board. Most had either primary, again, primary opioid or alcohol. And then um, psychiatric diagnosis, lifetime just under half and about the majority had prior treatment. And um, um, interestingly, what we found was that um, the quality of life uh, in this sample was substantially higher than in our national recovery um, uh, study. Uh, I think one of the things that these centers um, can do is, as I mentioned, providing access to these recovery resources can actually improve people's quality of life and self-esteem and happiness sooner. And we found even though this population in this sample were um, had far fewer years in recovery, their quality of life was substantially enhanced relative to people in the general population who are in recovery. So there's something about these recovery community centers that they are providing that is enhancing people's quality of life, at least what that's what the data suggest. And this is just highlighting that uh, in our national recovery study here, take 15 years um, uh, before they reach the same level as the general population. These folks are, super, uh, are exceeding that within a much shorter time frame. So there's something good news here potentially about these recovery support centers that they're providing and I think when we tested our model here, our theoretical model, we found support, particularly for accessing recovery capital. In fact, we found this unique pathway here through recovery capital by which participation in the recovery community centers enhanced remission and quality of life was by enhancing recovery capital. It also enhanced recovery support, interestingly, but it was something very unique that recovery community centers are providing by way of community, uh, providing recovery capital, which in turn boosts people's self-esteem, quality of life, and decreases psychological distress. The last thing I'll mention is that um, our third aim was looking at new participants. So we found that the new participants seeking uh, help at these recovery community centers were mostly young to middle-aged, we had about one quarter that were young adult, which is very hard to engage young people, uh, racially diverse, single, unemployed, low education and income, again, suffering from opioid or alcohol use disorders. Again, the opioid group are overrepresented given their, uh, their prevalence in the general population of people with substance use disorder. So there's something about people with opioid use disorder that are finding a home here and the building materials that they really need. Uh, alcohol, of course, is not a surprise given 75% of SUD cases nationally are alcohol, um, but the opioid group are overrepresented, therefore, in terms of utilization 
of these recovery uh, support centers. Um, most of these new people coming have a history of comorbid mental health problems and prior treatment. Again, reflecting a high degree of need, high degree of clinical pathology history, as well as a great need for recovery capital. Of note here, I think one thing that's important, we found that people got better, that they improved in their quality of life, their function, functioning, their happiness, decreased psychological distress over time as they participated. But one thing that was noteworthy was one of the strongest predictors of utilization of these was whether it took 15 minutes or less to access the center. That was a strong predictor of utilization. So of course, this has implications for recovery community centers in rural areas where accessibility is at a premium. So uh, this means that we need to think intelligently um, about how we can, for, in rural areas, get people to access to these centers and maybe the tele-recovery or telehealth or tele-recovery uh, phenomena that we can utilize these telehealth aspects through, uh, through uh, digital portals that we can access some of this stuff uh, potentially and enhance uh, people's chances of accessing these resources and providing the help we need. Um, and as I mentioned, there were uh, substantial benefits in terms of um, the gains that they made in, in, in utilizing um, these services. Just a few limitations before I end um, is that um, you gotta remember these are preliminary data. Uh, they, they, they show signs of benefit, um, but they are cross-sectional data. There's no comparison group. Uh, we don't know the degree to which these changes are attributable to RCC participation per se. So we have to be careful in terms of um, uh, what we can say about them, but they do show the, all the signals in the right direction. Conceptually, they are uh, supported. The, the, the conceptual model of RCCs is getting support from the data that are being collected, such as these. Um, and we're seeing this expansion, therefore, in these services over time. I will stop there because I'm out of time and uh, pass it back to Nelly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for that remarkable presentation and sharing your research. We will now hear from Dr. Mark Deppman, who has experience utilizing peer recovery coaches in a different environment, the emergency department. Dr. Deppman has practiced emergency medicine since 1989. He moved from New Haven, Connecticut to Vermont in, 20, in 2007 and has worked in the emergency department at Central Vermont Medical Center since then. He was department chair and medical director through 2015 and has managed concurrent federal and state grants in the area of substance use disorder in rural populations since 2013. He is currently project director of CVMC's three-year HRSA Rural Communities Opioid Response Program Implementation Grant. We are excited to hear about the development of that program today. Thank you, Nelly. Um, and I just want to say welcome to our colleagues in, in Maine and New Hampshire. Um, see a lot of them are on the call, as well as people from around the country. Um, I hope it's not a surprise to you that I'm broadcasting from what looks like an interior of a barn in Vermont and using an iPad. So um, I'm not able to share my, my slides. So Nelly's going to do that for me and excuse for the, you know, the next slide, next slide business. So Nelly, if you want to go ahead and get them started, that would be great. I will. It's fantastic being bookmarked by um, John Kelly with his remarkable academic objective work supporting the work that we all do. Um, and on the other side to have a peer recovery coach who lives the life, who's got the objective, subjective and passionate um, aspects of living in this world. Um, I'm really humbled to do that. Uh, I'm coming to you all as a ER doctor um, in a practice in an ER setting where uh, our staff and our, um, our professional staff in the ER from the nurses to the techs to the doctors um, are all really engaged in making a difference with this population. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that because I think um, a, lot of, a lot of how the medical community merged in this regard with our uh, local community and the local organizations is actually instructive and perhaps helpful for, for many of you on the call. So bear with me while I do a little, little bit of that during this talk. Um, next slide. 
just so you know where we are, um, we're in the smack in the center of Vermont. Um, our county uh, and touching towns in our county comprise around 26 towns, um, Center of Vermont Medical Center and our recovery center, the Turning Point Center are right in the middle uh, in uh, the area of Montpelier and Barrie, the two largest cities in our area. Montpelier is the state capital. And um, down south of us is Randolph, a town with a medical center there as well. It's a critical access hospital um, with whom we um, share a lot of interests and some programming. Um, but if you look at a Google map of our area, it's all trees and forests and mountains. And the question is, how do we assertively link people to peer recovery services in such a rurally dispersed population? Uh, Dr. Kelly touched on a lot of those issues. Um, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of a um, from the perspective of a center point, which is the emergency department of a community hospital that is really located in this rural thicket of trees and mountains. Next slide. So um, the Turning Point Center, located in Barry, um, is a well-functioning, highly functioning organization. Um, they've been at this for quite a while. Um, they've got a large um, uh, menu of programming and accessibility times. Um, they've got um, everything from job and career counseling to a writer's group to uh, many of the programming that you all are familiar with and I'm sure and which Dr. Kelly touched on and which I'm sure Liza will discuss as well. Next slide. But the point, you know, I think that's really outstanding about peer recovery work is that we need to accommodate the many paths to recovery. Um, I'm gonna be talking at the ED because it's a unique locus of acute crisis for people throughout our rurally dispersed region. A lot of people end up in our ER um, and that creates an opportunity, an extraordinary moment in time for peer recovery coaches to assertively connect with these people and, and then stay connected assertively connected means being there. And the emergency department brings all sorts of things. Um, you know, on any given, you know, the other morning I was working and I took care of a, a man in his late forties who came in from a motor vehicle accident. And, you know, I asked him, well, what happened? And he said, I just, I just started, you know, I just, my heart was racing and all of a sudden my mind went blank and he went off the road. And with a little bit of time and patience, um, I got this story that the night before you know, his wife had said she was leaving him because he was drinking. And he was basically, and he basically said, I think I had an anxiety attack and it led to a car accident. And that moment allowed him to say, I think there's a connection. And I said, I think we can, can we work with you a little bit around this issue you've identified with your, with your alcohol use? And he said, sure. And it's so typical of that sort of moment where a seemingly unconnected event actually exposes a root cause that we wanted to take and go run with and help that person. And it happens across whether it's, you know, valvular endocarditis from injecting drugs to a mental health crisis, um, to an example like this with I gave with the gentleman, we wanna be prepared to connect those people assertively to what can help them. Next slide. So to help demonstrate that, um, I'd like you to tell a little story about our department. Um, and it goes back to around 2012, 2011. And we actually sort of at a staff meeting, the nurses and the doctors said, you know, what are we doing for people who come in here that are withdrawing or they need help because of their drug use or their, or their alcohol use. We're not doing anything, what are we doing? And we realized that what we were doing was giving them a probably a 10 year old printout with the name of some local resources that we knew nothing about um, and sending them out. And honestly, with a, with a really old sort of 1980s attitude of they need to help themselves and here's the list, go help yourself, goodbye. Um, and we just looked at that and we were like astonished looking in the mirror and we said, we've got to do something different. And it was at that point that um, we, we had an opportunity through the state um, to start, start thinking about universal screening. 
And this was around the same time that Vermont was setting up its um, hub and spoke model for opioid treatment. And it couldn't have happened at a better time. So we had some grant funding and we began doing universal screening in the ED uh, for drug and alcohol use and tobacco use. And we were able to fund for five years uh, embedded social workers who actually were the engines of doing the in-depth screening, the motivational interviewing and the connection to services that we were just learning about what those services were. Um, did we as doctors and PAs and nurses have time to sit down and do that motivational exploration with, the, with our patients? Not usually. Um, it's a pretty hectic environment. It's a highly fractured and fractionated environment. Um, and having people that have the time to sit down and listen and um, understand and motivate and coach um, made an enormous difference. So as we did this work, we realized that we didn't know our community partners um, and we reached out and started to meet them all. And these were partners in prevention, uh, harm reduction and disease prevention, uh, treatment, um, recovery, uh, police, people, um, organizations involved in um, um, restorative justice. And we were all worked together to develop a regional coalition. And we called it at the time, the Washington County Substance Abuse Regional Partnership, quite a mouthful. Um, and over the last uh, six months, actually, we've transitioned to a new name, which is the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition. And with that coalition formed, um, we started monthly meetings and began to think about projects and ways that we could be working collaboratively to support the real goals, and that is to help the people in our communities. Um, and that's when the Turning Point Center of Central Vermont got involved be, with, with this coalition. And they've really been one of the backbone organizations along with the medical center um, to make um, our work actually actionable. So one of those first illustrations was um, starting to think about, um, we wanted to start rapid access to MAT in our emergency department as a pilot project for the state. Um, and to do that, we recognized that we were gonna need the peer recovery coaches integrally involved in that work. Um, so we explored the Rhode Island uh, Anchor Recovery ED model um, and actually adopted that for our ED. And with some gr grant funding once again, and you'll hear this as a recovering, as a, a recurring theme and really barrier um, going forward, um, we were able to get embedded peer recovery coaches 24-7 um, responding to the emergency department for people presenting uh, looking for rapid access to medically assisted treatment, buprenorphine. Um, all of our ED providers were, became wavered back then. Um, and this program got off to a really good positive start. And it only could have happened with the participation of our peer recovery coaches. Um, in 2019, uh, we applied for a HRSA r -Corp planning grant for our coalition. Um, and the hospital as the sponsoring agency was awarded that. And here again, the Turning Point Center um, really played an incredible part uh, participating in the development of a needs assessment and a strategic plan for our area. Um, that really set the stage for a lot of the work that they would start to um, expand into uh, as, best, as, as, as best we could over time. Um, we were then awarded a three-year implementation grant, and we're now in just initiating year two of that. Um, and the new exciting thing is that um, we're actually going to be piloting through our ER with the collaboration of the recovery center and one of our addiction medicine practices in Montpelier. We're going to be demonstrating that a hub and spoke model for alcohol dependence um, with rapid access to um, referral to treatment, if not actual medically assisted treatment initiating in the emergency department. So um, we're just going to be starting that in October. And the peer recovery coaches are once again an integral part of that and will be part of that 24-7 response team um, that would be based in the emergency department. Next slide. As I said, 
there are many paths to recovery and the one we're exploring is just one way of assertively connecting them. It's a way for us to also focus on the social determinants that will impact the success of recovery. And here, um, you know, in the emergency department setting, unlike at the recovery center itself, um, our ability to really delve into these things um, relies on the help of some of our hospital staff. Um, so we have a, um, a case management team that uh, is centered in the emergency department. And they were able to help us with getting a, a deeper level of um, risk assessment uh, through higher level screening. Um, they also can do more in depth uh, assessment of potential social determinants that would be barriers to people's recovery. And uh, also things like linking people to transportation and insurance. Um, we don't expect our peer recovery coaches to be able to manage all that in the emergency department. Their job really is to get people to, to agree to become part of a RAM program for opioid or road program for alcohol uh, dependence, um, get them enrolled and really become their trusted navigator through you know, the next month or so of their engagement with our programs. The peer, the peer recovery coaches in the emergency department work together with our staff, with the nurses, the doctors, the APPs, and the social workers, part of the care team. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it, it's more than once that I've heard, heard a peer recovery coach say, you know, it's amazing the doctors and the nurses actually ask me for advice. They ask me what, what they think I would do with this patient. You know, it's a remarkable team effort. Um, and I think what's really interesting, you talked about the social, and Dr. Kelly mentioned the social identity um, that peer recovery coaches can, can um, help bring to the fore uh, with their patients and clients. It's also true about the staff. I mean, I think the, the presence and the skill set and the really just the wonderful nature of our peer recovery coaches has just brought incredible nuance to understanding the lives of our patients. Um, because everyone recognizes that these folks were there once before. Um, and it's gone a long way to reducing stigma um, in our department. Um, they are the glue that holds this continuum of care together uh, in the eyes of our staff and in the reality of our patients and clients when they are discharged out to our, distance, our distant towns and uh, hollows in our rural area. Next slide. So in the ED, and I'm sure Liza is going to talk about this a little bit, um, we have 24-7 availability. Um, the iPads were used during the deep months of COVID um, before all of our staff were vaccinated. Our, you know, our nursing staff would bring an iPad into a patient who would connect with the peer recovery coaches based outside of the hospital. Um, but now we're back to in-person. Um, our peer recovery coaches are paged through the electronic medical system. So if I were working and I had a patient um, that I wanted them to uh, interact with, I'd put an order in for the unit secretary to page them and they would uh, be with the patient. It seems like just minutes later, <laughs> they managed to get here and they stick with that patient uh, for hours at times. Um, after discharge, um, they attempt to contact them once a day for 10 days and three times a week for, three, for four weeks. Um, once contact is made, there are 30 days of engagement by mutual consent. Um, just as a data point, uh, in our last quarter, uh, there were 124 total and 67 unique participants. And there was a 91% engagement rate, which I think is just extraordinary within 48 hours. Um, and it's been reported to me by some of the coaches that patients who decline services sometimes reach, reach out later to engage. Um, our peer recovery coaches are involved in data collection to some extent. And this is, an, this is a really interesting area that I think always bears conversation. Um, as we're starting our road program with alcohol dependence, and we're adding another layer of some data collection and we're actually revisiting that um, literally in conversations right now because the last thing we want is for the peer recovery coaches to have something that sets up a barrier. And sometimes collecting GIPRA data or uh, just 
other forms of data that are important for follow up and important for, for you know, outcome tracking um, can get in the way a little bit. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to minimize that at the same time, you know, when you're dealing with different agencies that are not connected by one EMR, um, you do need to get onto some platform, enter data that everyone can share and track over time. So that's an interesting balance that we're, we're learning to navigate. Um, our peer recovery coaches have, um, are in the process of figuring out how to work even more closely with the care management team in the hospital. And this is especially relevant um, with our alcohol program because a significant number of those patients actually will be admitted to the hospital. And so for the peer recovery coaches to be going upstairs onto the wards is something they've been doing over the last couple of years. Um, but we're gonna be seeing that as more important for the alcohol engagement and the maintenance of that level of motivation that the patients are developing. And also to pair with the um, case management team to make sure that the referrals to the addiction medicine clinic are being made and being tracked um, afterwards. Um, so that's an interesting new dynamic that's gonna take on some added value around this new initiative around alcohol. And I just wanna shout out to Cora for some of the help that they've given us uh, with um, A, harm reduction tools, um, but also access to track phones, medication lock boxes that we've been able to extend to our clients uh, through the work we're doing both in the ED and back at the recovery center. Next slide. Some of our successes I think are worth mentioning. Eliza will probably talk about this a, a, a bit. Um, and that is in understanding the role of training and supervision. Um, and by using the Recovery Coach Academy and the Coach Revision program that's developed by, through CCAR in Vermont, um, I think we're, uh, our, peer, our, our recovery center has really been able to up their game in a really positive way um, that I think is giving more satisfaction to the recovery coaches, understanding that there's, there's training, there's supervision, there's peer support among themselves um, that builds teams, that builds support within teams, because this is stressful work. And you know, a supervisor in this setting really needs to be sensitive to and understand the mood, the affective um, sense of her team or his, her, his team, and respond to that in a way that has a skill set behind it. So it's exciting to me that our recovery center has been able, that has been doing that so confidently and proactively. Um, it increases opportunities for shadowing to build confidence with new peer recovery coaches. And I believe all this helps with retention in this challenging environment that we have um, compounded, not only by being rural, but by being in the second of probably an incoming third year of this pandemic. Next slide. Challenges, challenges are real. Um, recruitment is a challenge, especially as we're increasingly looking for peer recovery coaches to have some uh, technical skills of getting onto databases and entering, um, entering information, um, communication skills in a hospital setting. Um, moving from the ED upstairs to an inpatient unit where you're not really on staff, you don't really go into the electronic medical record, like who are you? And so it's really important to make sure these folks have introductions in these units and that um, primarily that the doctors upstairs and the case management teams know who they are and understand their critical role. Um, sustainable funding. Um, I'm sure all of you have identified this. Um, getting grants as we've done over the last eight years has been fantastic for setting things up, but supporting them and sustaining them uh, continues to be a challenge. And I'm convinced that the payers, whether it's the state or Blue Cross Blue Shield in Vermont, need to be understanding the peer recovery services are part of the care team and that the that these these costs need to be calculated into some sort of bundled payment so that they can be sustained. I suspect at least in Vermont, where we're moving towards um, a more population health model of reimbursement. Um, this is just super important. Uh, back to recruiting and retention, uh, livable wages and benefits um, are also a tremendous barrier to uh, hiring and, and maintaining staff. 
Um, I think we've done reasonably well with our current hourly compensation model. Um, a lot of folks in the peer recovery uh, coach community uh, have other work. And so half time work is what's mostly sustainable for them. But we're increasingly being able to move into full time capacity because of, once again, some grant funding. Um, once again, we need sustainability for that. Um, benefits are currently not part of that landscape of employment, and that's a huge disadvantage. So um, all this, uh, all these are challenges. Next slide. One unexpected challenge um, was our hospital HR department was um, kind of caught flat foot a couple of years ago with doing some background checks um, and finding that there were issues with some of our um, peer recovery coaches come on board with, um, with things um, in their history. Um, and those things led to delays. They often led to episodes of, of triggering, triggering previous traumatic life um, for our peer recovery coaches and painful conversations. I think we've gotten through that. Um, I think our, our HR department has made a lot of advances in their understanding of the role. Um, because they'll tell you, uh, anyone will tell you that the very experience that may be in their eyes disqualifying this person is actually what makes them great at their work. Um, a peer recovery coach said to me, when people in recovery change their lives, they change their lives. So um, I just, I, th I think that's worth pointing out to any of you working, work, working through this space. Next slide. So the demand just keeps increasing. As our first speaker said, the validation of the value of peer recovery coaches is just being recognized in spades. And right now, our, our peer recovery coaches are already connected to all sorts of programming. And they've been doing this throughout and beyond COVID. Uh, remote access is a reality now. And especially in, I mean, if anything, COVID was kind of a blessing in showing that the value of remote access and adding Skype and Zoom to, to center-based meetings. Um, we did a survey back in January through our coalition of people in treatment and recovery. And one of the questions was, uh, it was about the uh, impact of COVID on their lives. And some of the feedback we got was around how initially there was enthusiastic uptake of remote um, programming of getting on a Zoom meeting that was based at the Turning Point Center. Um, but that waned over time, the satisfaction with it waned over time. So I think um, we're, you know, we need to be focused on how to make those meetings even more engaging, meaningful and robust. Um, not only because COVID's continuing and may continue to be a barrier to in-person participation, um, and there may be disruptive things like this in the future, but also just it's a reality in rural communities with transportation barriers and weather barriers and things like that. Um, our peer recovery coaches are already connected to our MAT teams in the hub and spoke model. They've got programs going with the Montpelier and Barry police departments for, um, for uh, connection to people in need. Um, they're participants in the Washington County Treatment Court, and they're working with our local um, community access hospital in Randolph um, in Orange County. Um, interesting areas that we're developing uh, with the leadership of the Recovery Center. One is to develop a regional advisory council of people with lived experience to guide our coalition. And, you know, this is incredibly important, especially as Dr. Kelly mentioned, um, in rural communities in, in New England, subgroups, it's really hard to support subgroups because they tend to be small groups of people. And we'd really like to use an advisory council to help identify them, get involved people with people's participation and figure out how to crack that nut um, and, and get subgroups more integrally involved in the, in the work we're doing uh, to help, help them lead um, lives in recovery. Um, we're also developing, which is, um, you know, it's a common thing nowadays in tertiary care centers to have combined uh, MAT clinics with obstetrics and postpartum and pediatrics. Women's clinics, a um, little tougher to do that in community hospitals, 
I know there are some happening. They're getting set up in Maine. Uh, right now, there's an initiative in Maine to get that work going. I know there are critical access hospitals in other states, including New Hampshire, where this has been done. We're trying to get this set up in Vermont now, and our peer recovery coaches will be an integral part of that work. We're also looking to develop a 24-7 behavioral health crisis intervention team in our county. Um, a crisis intervention team based on the CIT model, which is probably known to many of you across the country. Um, right now, we have a good model for that with our mental health screeners who have a mobile unit, but we don't involve um, substance use counselors or peer recovery coaches, and we're looking to do that. Um, it's actually, a, it's, it's, it's a whole new program because we're really trying to look afresh at um, de-emphasizing policing and moving community-based organizations to the fore in behavioral health crisis um, response and um, intervention 24-7. Um, we're preparing for the 988 call line to be implemented in 2022, and this will um, dovetail with that. Um, we also have a recovery housing unit opening later this year for mothers with children. Um, and we're assuming, and I know that our peer recovery coaches will be part of that uh, programming there as well. Our justice centers are looking for some participation with the peer recovery coaches as well, uh, with people coming out of incarceration, um, being reintroduced into the community. And that's a really natural fit, um, but a different um, set of training likely that may be needed for our peer recovery coaches to be thinking about. And as our primary care practices, at least here in central Vermont, um, start a interesting transition to an integrated behavioral health model in primary care, uh, we've had a lot of primary care providers asking us how peer recovery coaches could perhaps have a role in uh, responding to uh, the need that they identify in primary care interventions. I'd also like to take a moment to introduce the fact that um, Vermont recently, back in the early days of the pandemic, started um, a statewide um, web-based and phone-based help link, the Vermont Help Link system, um, which is currently getting a fair amount of uptake um, from, the pop, from the public, uh, looking for help for themselves or others um, with substance use disorders. Um, that is actually being, um, you know, the, the, the state has contracted with Health Resources in Action, a, an operation out of Boston um, that navigates those patients through to treatment that is local to them. Um, we're very interested in working with them and we have a, we're expecting to have some conversations with them about potentially having a direct link to a peer recovery coach via an immediate uh, phone call or a video call um, perhaps developing that over the next couple of years as well. Um, next slide. So I, I think that's about it. Now, uh, I think that this is a great transition to Liza to talk about the actual life and the work of a peer recovery coach. And I look forward to coming back with questions that synthesize and bring together these three topics. Thank you, Dr. Detman, for such a thorough presentation on the development of your Rural Emergency Department-based peer recovery program. We will now hear from Liza Ryan, a peer recovery coach with experience providing peer support in both the emergency department and community centers. Originally from Buffalo, New York, Liza has lived in Vermont since 2016. Liza graduated from Champlain College in 2020 with a bachelor's in social work and a bachelor's of science in criminal justice. She is currently earning her master's degree in social work from SUNY at Buffalo. Liza has been in recovery since December 2013 and has worked as a peer recovery coach since 2017. Liza has served as a part-time recovery coach at the Turning Point Center of Chittenden County and the North Central Vermont Recovery Center and as a Rural Emergency Department Peer Recovery Coach at the University of Vermont Medical Center and Copley Hospital in Morrisville. Liza works full-time as a registered psychotherapist at the Institute for Trauma Recovery and Resiliency in Colchester, Vermont. Thank you for joining us today, Liza. We're, ex we're excited to hear your perspective on peer support programs. 
everyone. Thank you so much, Nelly, for the introduction and um, for everyone being here. And oh, let me make sure I can move to the next slide. I can't. There we go. Okay. Um, and it, I, I do think this was beautiful timing, um, being able to, to come out, come on after Mark. Um, so thank you for that presentation, and also being for being such an incredible advocate for the for the peer recovery coaching program. So starting off, um, really mentioned a, a little bit. So I moved to Vermont in 2016 to go to college. And I've been in, in recovery back home in Buffalo for a little bit. And recovery for me looked very different back in Buffalo. Um, I come, well, I entered recovery through residential treatment and some outpatient treatment. Um, and then really the bulk of my recovery has been consistent of 12-step meetings. Um, and I, I will say that the 12-step meetings I attended back home was a little bit of stigmatized around, you know, if... Um, if you can't make it in 12-step meetings, then you're doing something wrong. You know, you're not, um, you know, it, it should work for you, um, as in that's the only way to, um, to get sober. And, and we've heard um, two others talk about how that's, that's completely not true, multiple paths to recovery. And the concept of recovery centers, um, the Turning Point Center in Chittenden County in Burlington is where I began. Um, I just, I began going to some 12-step meetings that the recovery center hosted, began to learn more about all the programming that was done there and, and just the sense of community there. And as someone who uh, only been to Vermont once before I came to college, um, <laughs> I was scared, I didn't want to relapse, and it felt pretty great to have a community like that. So I began going to meetings, I was interested in becoming a recovery coach fall of 2017. I uh, absolutely loved it, would meet with about five to six people individually per week, um, which was amazing because I was a college student, I was able to make some more money, um, gain a different perspective. And then in fall of 2018, I joined the um, the emergency department peer recovery coach team at UVMMC in Burlington. Uh, and I was like, I was like, this needs to be happening everywhere. I absolutely loved being a part of that team. Um, and I was with them up until I moved in February out to Loyal County, which is uh, why I'm here talking about rural recovery as well. So, and in being connected with the recovery center, not only in Burlington, but also out in Morrisville at, during the beginning of uh, COVID, spring of 2020, I began working in some of the general assistance hotels in Chittenden County. Um, mostly then it was, uh, well, to be honest, I don't, I don't think anyone really knew what we were quite doing then, but the goal was to provide housing support, um, have folks who were experiencing homelessness fill out housing applications, get them connected to any economic services um, programs and assistance. And really I saw through my work as a recovery coach through the hospital, through the recovery center. And also I, during my senior year of college, I was in an internship with Burlington Police Department where as a social worker, I provided some services to high risk folks. Um, again, experiencing homelessness, substance use, alcohol use disorder, um, and a lot of mental health crises as well. So I began to know and be able to work with a lot of that population. And I started doing a little bit of recovery work um, on site there. Um, just because it was, it was a need there. So, and moving out with North Central Vermont Recovery Center, I was able to do strictly recovery day services in person on site at the three general assistance hotels in Lamoille County. They were located in Stowe, Morrisville, and Jeffersonville. So becoming a peer recovery coach, um, again, Different paths of uh, different paths of recovery being um, respected and utilized and, and really embraced. Um, for some folks, right, it looks it looks like strictly harm reduction. Um, abstinence based is not a necessity to be in recovery by any means at all. And frankly, since you know, for being in recovery for almost eight years. Um, and being in recovery as someone who's young, by, by the time I was 18 and graduated high school, I've lost over 30 friends. So frankly, I, I really, I mean this in the uh, most clinical or educational way I can say it, but I really don't care what you're doing in recovery. As long as it's healthy, you have a connection to, to healthy, healthy folks and healthy services, um, and you feel supported. 
So, right, maybe that does look like 12 step programs that still remains um, the foundation for my recovery. Um, programs such as smart recovery, medication assisted support groups, um, if that's part of your recovery, spirituality, alternative treatments. You know, I saw, I know some folks who they go to yoga four times a week religiously, and that's, that's really great for them. And that's what works. So looking at, um, right, getting connected to the resources. Um, Mark had touched on some things that definitely um, we would need more of in the state, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. But um, right, this this disease it really is amazing at making you feel very isolated and making you feel really shamed about about what's been going on. So knowing that what re, what resources are out there, being able to help folks get connected to them, um, and maybe it's it's purely just educational, you know, letting people know what services are what. Um, really serving as kind of a guide to, you know, helping give someone the roadmap about, you know, what they need to do or, or first things first, right? Being able to get connected with people. And that goes right into meeting people where they're at, right? Um, I saw a lot of social workers identify themselves in the, the chat, which is awesome. Really, you know, I'm going to work with where my client, with where, where my recovery, um, with where they're at. So, you know, if you're coming to, to look at recovery coaching through a recovery center, not through the ED, and, you know, you've been in recovery for two and a half years, but you find that, you know, some pieces are missing um, and you want to get more involved. Awesome. Great. Um, if you're coming into the ED because you haven't ate in a couple of days, you're really unhealthy, you have an infection, um, and you have no place to stay, and you're experiencing a lot of really severe mental health symptoms. Great, awesome. Let's, you know, let's get started and, and see, you know, where we can help and where you can get connected to, you know, to any services at a higher, higher level of care. So transitioning into a rural community, um, again, I think Mark did, um, and Dr. Kelly as well did a great job of, of touching on a lot of these, right? Basic, like it's it's a lot farther to walk to Morrisville to Jeffersonville than it is down the street to a different service provider in Burlington. Um, you know, less a lot less rural community. Um, long drives to to map providers, especially the hubs, um, the hub and spoke model in Vermont has been mentioned a couple times. Right now, I, I work with a recovery house through my full-time job providing clinical services. Uh, it's in Johnson, Vermont. And if you're located in Johnson, you're either driving to a hub in Burlington, Vermont, or you're driving to a hub um, up in, oh my goodness, now I'm going to Newport, Vermont. So both of which are, you know, 50, 55 minutes. Um, if you're looking to start employment, you know, child care, um, even if you have treatment needs that, you know, maybe you're in an IOP program or um, you're trying to fit everything in, that, that can be a huge barrier. Um, put this under lack of connection, visibility, also just being able to find and, you know, I, I put find your people. And by that, I mean, right, there are those who, you know, you can connect with, um, this is really focusing on, on the peer aspect. And this is right, the, the peer and the peer recovery centers and the peer recovery coaches. Um, so, you know, if your service providers are laid out in, in different towns across a, a very rural county, then, you know, it's not all in, all in the same place. So, you know, finding rides across, okay, my, my map provider is here, but my, you know, my mental health clinician is over here and the recovery is over here, the recovery center is over here. Right. Um, and also this has been severely impacted um, by COVID as well, but already in rural counties, there's less in-person recovery meetings. Um, and that goes for 12 step, any other type of self-help meetings. Um, so there's already less of those. There are barely no in-person meetings for a long time during COVID, which right for some the the virtual meetings can can cut it, but you know, really, you you want to be able to find that connection, that sense of belonging, right? That's that's the part that pe keeps people coming back, um, and that's what 
is really important and that can be challenging with rural land abuse. Um, housing, I don't, I <laughs> could talk all day about this. Um, the lack of, you know, not, not just housing period, but the lack of, you know, safe, sober, sustainable housing. Um, since moving out to Lamoil County, I've experienced this so much, um, even more so than, than where I was in Burlington at UVMMC. Um, and right, folks may have housing, but they may have lived in the same place for, you know, three and a half years, and they live with four other people who are also engaged in substance use, but maybe are not quite ready or willing to cease their use. Um, and I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't think that I would have a lot of um, success or feel really supported in, in that type of living environment. Um, and then also, right, being able to apply for housing. Um, if your employment history, if you haven't been um, employed by maybe a recovery um, friendly or a recovery minded or recovery centered agency that, um, you know, that could look like a very choppy resume, um, which we, we do try to help with a lot of that at the recovery center with some employment services. Um, and then also involvement in the criminal justice system um, that could impede on that too. So really being able to have um, kind of more recovery informed housing um, that is able to, to work with them. Um, so working as peer recovery coach in, in more rural communities, again, um, being able to, I, I found that when I've worked with someone in the ED, I've often, you know, I've, I've met them in person at the ED after being paged there, and I've continued to um, continue to work with them. You know, that interaction does not end there. Not only are we doing the follow-up calls, but I know there's been team members of mine who have continued working with that person as their recovery coach. So meaning that they're meeting with them once a week, um, they're continuing to be engaged, and really for me, you know, I, I, I think that's amazing because you, you know, no one is arriving in the emergency department feeling really good about themselves for, in their substance use, right? And when, you know, myself, all of our team members are able to go in there, right? It, it's judgment free, right? We're not there to tell you what to do. We really just want to hear, you know, what, what is going on and, and where we can help. So kind of the, the trust and, you know, they, maybe you can find that you can be a little more honest about what's going on and what you need, knowing that, you know, you're not going to receive more of that, that shame and stigma is right. That's, that's invaluable. <clears throat> so this is discussing working as a, as a recovery coach in the emergency department versus the recovery center. Um, and Mark had mentioned, right, we're on call. Um, I was page 215 this morning, so we were definitely on call 24-7. Um, access to recovery coach within 30 minutes, even in rural Lamoille County, will be there within 30 minutes. Um, very often, if you're in the hospital, maybe that looks like being admitted to the hospital. Um, usually residential treatment is a conversation. Um, maybe it's a connection with the mental health partners that we work with, and that's having them complete a screening and a referral to, um, to more psychiatric-based services where we can then follow up afterwards. Um, and in the emergency department, it can often be someone's first introduction to recovery services. Usually one of the first or second questions I ask is, have you ever heard of us? Do you know what we do? You know, who, who am I, what, what I do? Um, becoming engaged with the recovery center, um, for a recovery coach, you could either call or visit the center to complete the intake. Um, you know, within two, I would say two, three days at the very most, you're, you're assigned with a recovery coach. And, and that coaching would be, right, it could be more than once a week, normally once a week. Um, and that is, is helpful in, in sustaining your support for recovery. So um, it's kind of highlighting the main differences. Being able to understand, um, again, this, 
this works as having a peer recovery code service, kind of a guide um, for anyone entering the ED, right? The ins and outs of what providers can help with, what versus what they what they cannot do. Um, Mark mentioned that some um, a lot of prescribers are working towards um, being able to administer buprenorphine in the ED. Um, there is a, a program in Memorial County rap to rapid access medication assisted treatment. And through Quora, again, being able to have a cell phone distribution where you know someone comes in, okay, how are we gonna connect with you? I don't have a phone. We can go right then and, and grab them a track phone with the uh, refillable minutes, which I so badly wanted in Burlington when I came over to working at Copley, I was very excited to, to hear that that was a, a program. Um, part as part of the work for me and that I've experienced, um, absolutely shortage of long-term residential beds in, in Vermont, um, and not just in Vermont, but in speaking about working with primarily Medicaid recipients, um, Medicaid won't approve. Um, if it's a service that's provided in Vermont, they won't approve if it's out of state. So really looking at Vermont, I know when I came to Vermont right around 2016, 2017, there was um, what I heard is a ridiculously long wait list for medication assisted treatment and that's significantly been cut down. Um, but still, right, hubs can only accommodate so many folks, same as folks. Um, so having the, the wait list, that, that can still be, still be a major barrier, especially when you're sitting with someone in the emergency department and you know that having them go back to their current living environment is less than favorable for them, right? Um, the last point here about having supportive housing for those kind of in, in the middle, right? Um, they're really committed to, to their recovery and, and, you know, getting some some help more than just outpatient, but residential treatment. Um, but they're not able to go to a sober house because that usually requires a lot of money to pay a first month's rent, or maybe there's another waiting list. Um, and their current situation, right, is not a, a good place to be. They know that when the, if they go back there, they're, they're going to engage again with their substance use. So really having an interim space for that, a lot of times that comes into, um, that would be really helpful again with um, mental health crises as well. Um, continuing to, to be in the emergency department in person, providing education, you know, who we are, what we do, this is how we can help. Um, I think just having folks know that there are services out there in the community. Um, I live in Johnson, Vermont. There was recently um, Jenna's House, which is a part of Jenna's Promise. Um, in a partnership with North Central Vermont Recovery Center, opened Jenna's house um, a, just a couple weeks ago. And um, it was just amazing to see. There were a lot of folks that came out just to see, you know, what's going on, what we do. Um, and just, just having that visibility, you know, like we know people are struggling in the community. Like, please come in, the door is always open. Um, and again, it's not always, I, I think having our recovery centers located in, in a certain part of the county and, and the satellite location, Jenna's house has is located in the town over. So right, if someone doesn't have transportation, they're still able to engage in some of those services in a different town. Uh, the most rewarding part of the work for me by far, just being able to connect with folks. Um, I work full time as a as a trauma clinician and often you know I, I love my work but sometimes it's great to just be able to to be able to talk with someone on a peer-to-peer -peer level and you know just say you know what's going on again how can we help um, our program when I was with Turning Point in Chittenden County in Burlington um, we actually worked with someone who was in the emergency who we saw as a patient in the emergency department and now serves as a recovery coach with the center and that was um, like that's, you know, it doesn't get much better than that. Like that's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and also my, right, my own history of um, addiction and using my recovery to, to benefit someone else really. Um, you know, I was through um, the end of my middle school and then mostly through high school, I was um, 
alcohol use and opiate use was basically running my life. And um, although I wasn't that old, it drove whatever I had going on in my life um, pretty much into the ground. And and being able to to use my story of, you know, yeah, I may not have lost a house, lost a family because I didn't have any of that. Um, but that that bottom of that despair, that loneliness, um, and again, that shame is, I think, pretty I've experienced pretty universal among a lot of folks that I've talked with in the emergency department or as a recovery coach. So just being able to share that connection, um, you know, I absolutely love being able to do to do the work that I do. And that is all that I have. So I will stop sharing my screen. Finished a couple minutes early for you, Nelly, sorry. <laughs> Totally good. Thank you so much, Liza, um, for sharing your experience as a peer recovery coach in both the emergency department and at recovery community centers. Now that we have heard from all three presenters, it is time for questions. I hope everyone has enjoyed hearing about peer recovery from many points of view. Dr. Kelly from the Recovery Research Institute shared with us the evidence behind recovery community centers. Dr. Detman from Central Vermont Medical Center went through the implementation of his rural emergency department-based peer recovery program, and Liza Ryan has explained her experience working in both environments as a peer recovery coach. I will now hand it over to Jenny Noel to facilitate questions. Hi there, let me unmute. Um, okay, so we have until about, um, we have about, 20 minutes or so to, for questions, which is great because we have a lot of questions. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to get these asked. Um, and I'm gonna start with questions that are for, mostly for um, Dr. Kelly. Uh, so one person asked uh, for Dr. Kelly, how do you envision ways for our recovery centers to engage people receiving medications for opioid use disorder? Great question. Um, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a cultural challenge I think we face in the field um, that's, that's been around for a long time. I think it's changing. Um, in the work that we have done with recovery community centers around New England and New York State, we have found generally positive attitudes overall towards medication assisted treatment. There is, and there may be, um, a vocal minority that are more vocal um, that may be opposed, and that may be what is heard um, uh, at some level um, by folks. But um, in general, there is these recovery centers because they celebrate um, all pathways to recovery, including the use of medications, agonist medications like buprenorphine and methadone. Um, all these recovery pathways should be celebrated. I think that is because that is the official policy. Um, uh, I think that is um, having an effect and impact on the culture within these recovery community centers. Now, these things take time to change also, um, but I think they are changing. Um, and especially in light of the tragedy that we've seen with opioid overdose deaths, um, I think it, it's been accelerated. The need is accelerated. Um, but I think, therefore, we can still, um, you know, across these centers, uh, celebrate all pathways to recovery, including the use of medications, be warm and welcoming, make it explicit that people on medications are explicitly warm, warmly welcomed to participate and that their, their pathway is as valid as any others. It does not mean you are still using, is it, this is, you know, sometimes a miss a misinterpretation. Uh, people are not, quote, still using if they're on an agonist therapy. Um, you know, in the same way that people who are taking, you know, have a nicotine patch when they, uh, they're quitting cigarettes, uh, they're using nicotine, but they're not still smoking. They are actively changing their behavior towards recovery. And the same is true of anybody on, a, on, a, on, a, on MAT, that they are moving in the direction of recovery. And I think that's important to remember. 
Thank you very much. Um, I have a two part comment slash question. I wanna read both of these together. One person asked a question and another person kind of followed up. Um, so the first person said, one slide suggested that 43% had MAT programming. Are there qualitative and quantitative data on the embrace slash opposition, et cetera, of the other 57%? A close friend was connected to an RCC that did a great job of building his stability and recovery capital. The emphasis of the NA groups on discontinuing medications had an impact on him and after a year of stability, he passed from an overdose after relapse. How do we support the provision of recovery capital and be clear-eyed about cultural dynamics that reduce or discourage MAT, MOUD um, use that thereby can increase mortality? And an another person said, this question presents by this person, by the other person presents it's most important, I think. I want to add focus to this idea. Dr. Kelly, you mentioned the double stigma as it burdens our LGBTQ community. Would you care to please address the double stigma as it burdens those with OUD receiving MOUD as seen as still using? That's not too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, it, it's, um, you know, uh, What's captured there again is similar to to what was brought up previously regarding the you know kind of the, the acceptance of, of medications across the board as a pathway to recovery, and this is particularly uh, apparent and present. We know uh, stigma, misunderstanding, as I see it, on the role that medications play in recovery, and that again we we have to be uh, very clear that recovery community centers. And all uh, all all recovery pathways should should be celebrated, and I think because there is so much stigma and misinformation regarding medications in particular, um, we need to be very explicit about educating the workforce, the peer workforce around these issues, and uh, making sure that the the policies are explicit regarding celebration of all pathways to recovery. And how, you know, again, using science uh, to show and demonstrate that people who are taking medications have a much lower risk of overdose and overdose death. And that is by itself um, very important information to get across. Uh, as is often said, you know, we, and, and, and the sad example that was just um, uh, expressed of the person dying from an overdose. Um, it's, it's very important that we use all and any means necessary to prevent death because there's, there's, there's not much you can do once someone is dead. Um, so we have to keep people, make sure we keep people alive. And this has become particularly apparent and very important um, in this opioid epidemic. And it's come to the front burner um, of, of recovery support services and our, our, our approach to these problems overall. So uh, again, just highlighting this, making it very explicit, educating the peer workforce, um, making sure this policy is up front and center that we don't discriminate um, against any pathway of recovery. Thank you very much. Uh, that's wonderful. I have um, one or two more for you, Dr. Kelly. Um, one person asked, were there any medical interventions offered in the RCOs in the study, either screening by public health nursing or vaccine clinics? Not in that I recall. Yeah, not there. There could have been minimal. And again, this study was done prior to COVID. Um, it was done several years ago now. Um, I think we started it in 20. 15, finished it in 2017, 2018. Um, so, um, uh, so there, it was a little bit, little bit, the data are a little bit older. Um, and, and there, there was, I just recall, there was not many official medical types of interventions um, offered in these uh, uh, centers overall, but there were linkages, of course, uh, linkages to many of these other kinds of medical services as part of what uh, what was done in the centers. Thank you. 
Um, one person, I think this is the last one uh, that I will ask. One person was curious what tool you used to measure quality of life and happiness. Huh. Well, mm -hmm. happy to share those. Uh, we, we, we chose the briefest tools possible that had the maximum predictive uh, validity and criterion validity, as you would hope. So uh, we used one that was developed by the World Health Organization on quality of life and functioning, which is very brief. It's just five, five items, which captures very nicely um, and, and it is equal to, to much longer surveys that capture the same construct of quality of life. Um, and happiness is just a single item that's been validated, just happy, how happy people are on a, on a zero to 10 scale. Um, again, it's been, it's been valid, validated. So we use whatever validated as brief as possible measures that we can uh, utilize to capture these, these constructs. Now, we have another one on recovery capital, which is just 10 items, um, which is shown to be equal to a much longer 50 item one. Uh, so again, using brief measures to capture these constructs is ideal. Um, so I'm happy to share those with you if you, if you want to reach out to me. Yes, thank you very much. Um, for just, just a reminder, for those of you whose questions we don't get to, we're going to do our best to follow up with you and get them answered. So never fear. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. There are a couple of others that are for all of the panelists, but I have um, a couple here for Dr. Deppman. I believe this one is, is for him. It says, how, were you, how are you able to assist patients presenting with both substance use and mental health issues? Oops, you're, you're uh, muted, Dr. Dutman. Sorry about that. Um, that's a really great question. Um, I would have to say at this point in time, um, they're sort of, at least in the emergency department setting, the acute, situation is generally one or the other. Um, I'm not saying that these that most of our patients are not co-occurring, which I think they actually are. Um, but I think we aim for the presenting issue, deal with the presenting issue. And then I think we, because you know, we do have mental health staff on the call 24 seven and we have an inpatient psychiatric unit and all the rest. Um, I think the deeper question is, is how well are we doing the uh, mental health component of the co-occurring component of our patients with substance use disorders? And I don't think we've cracked that nut that well yet. Um, I think our peer recovery coaches have identified that they don't really know how to access mental health resources necessarily when they need them for their patients and clients, the people they're working with. I would also say that the mental health system in Vermont is highly stressed, which it probably is across the country, and access for anyone um, is a significant barrier right now. Um, so my answer is it's not great. And I think we're, we're, we want to do better. I think we can do better, um, but there are a lot of systemic barriers to it. Um, but we are able to uh, pretty much, you know, we have staff available, um, both for the substance use support and the mental health support in our ED and in our community. It's just a matter of how vigorous is that access. Thank you very much. Um, I think this one is also for you, Dr. Dutman. Um, this person is asking, what ideas slash solutions have you explored for data collection among partners who aren't within one system with a common EHR? Is that, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's really hard to do that. Um, we're actually uh, with our alcohol dependence, uh, rapid access to treatment and hub and spoke model um, pilot that we're just about to launch. Uh, we are actually all sharing a common third-party platform um, that is actually um, being provided by UVM. And um, so it will, unfortunately, it will exist outside of sort of Epic, which the hospital's on and whatever other systems people have, um, but it will allow us to track our patients and clients on the same um, record system. It's not a proper medical record system, but it is a it's a, it's a system of tracking patients where you can put in data 
um, screening, screening results, uh, com free text comments, uh, touch points and where they are in the treatment path, et cetera. Um, so that's how we're doing that. Um, and, I, and we're waiting and we have not used it yet, but we're, we've got a lot of hope that it's gonna be a useful tool for all of us. Um, it's a big problem uh, in all this work. I'm sure all of you share that. Um, can I just interrupt? For, I've seen a lot of questions um, pointed towards me about something I think is really important to talk about. Um, and that is how you engage um, medical people in this work. Um, I was at a HRSA ARCOR planning grant meeting in early 2020 down in Washington. And I had this question asked to me in a large group of several, you know, probably 600 people. And almost all of them had were, were, were cared about this response. Um, because it sounds like across much of the country, it's a problem. And, you know, Vermont's a little bit of a bubble. Um, you know, our um, payer, you know, the state's payer system and our health department are incredibly strong advocates for, for these issues. Um, our hub and spoke model, point, you know, points to that. Um, the hub and spoke model deep reaches into primary care. Um, the blueprint for health, which is a payment system for, um, for, uh, community health teams in primary care uh, is, is built on the assumption that these issues are going to be addressed in primary care. So, you know, it's hard for me to comment on what it's like outside of Vermont because we, li we do live in kind of a blessed state um, in this regard. Of course, you know, there's always more we can do, and but this is a state that looks towards innovation. But Outside of Vermont, uh, I get the sense that it's tough. And in emergency medicine, at least in my little bailiwick, I know that a lot of emergency departments are staffed by um, for-profit groups that are just hired by the hospital. And they just care about racking up charges and paying their doctors and not responding to the community needs. Um, but there are also a lot of other hospitals that where the doctors are employed, um, where there is a board of trustees that cares. Um, sometimes these are academic medical centers that have affiliates. Uh, academic medical centers do tend to care about these issues. Um, and they do tend nowadays to have many, many affiliate hospitals in these large systems of care. Um, I, you need a champion. Um, any community that has disparate or you know, unified organizations working in this field, in the medical sphere, you need a, you need a physician champion, a nursing champion. And how you find them, I think, you know, someone needs to have the chutzpah to get in front of a board of trustees or a chief medical officer of a hospital or an emergency department chair or director and ask the question, what are you all doing with, with these patients? Um, because I think, I think the, the, the profession, if you look at emergency medicine in general, um, people care. Uh, but you need institutional support. You also need support from your state departments of health. But um, I know that at least in, in Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine, um, uh, people have asked me to speak to um, people at other hospitals and I've been happy to do that as, as have some of my colleagues. Um, and I'm happy to do that frankly anywhere in the country. Um, and I, I know that other people would do that too, but I think it takes doctors convincing other doctors Sometimes the path to that is literally through a board of trustees. Sometimes it's through a medical officer. And sometimes it's just work. It's, it's about approaching a department chair or department director and saying, what are you all doing about this? You've got a community of partners here. What are you doing? Thank you, Dr. Detman. I'm glad you um, responded to that because we, we did have a lot of different questions that spoke to that question uh, generally. Um, I do have a couple questions that are for the whole panel, but before I get to those, there's a few that came in that are, are for Liza. Um, and I want to, let's see. Um, one person said, are small community environments and quote, being known a powerful detriment to using support groups? Sorry, so having small, Small, small yeah, small community environments and the fact that you might be known in that community, is that a detriment to using support groups? I think that question is for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, in my I'm, short answer, yes. Um, but also 
my experience has been that literally everyone knows everyone. Um, so that in, in the same sense, you know, where, um, where else would you, you turn? You're, you're going to find someone that knows you, uh, regardless. Um, I've lived, um, at Lamoille County just since February. And I feel like I know more people in the emergency department there, more of the nurses and the medical team than I got to know in uh, a year and a half at UVMMC, which is of no fault to them, just that it's a smaller community and it has um, such a different, um, just such, such a different way of, of interacting with folks. So, um, right, recovery meetings are smaller. Um, recovery meetings have people from different towns that um, I think in less rural communities, you wouldn't have. So yeah, that can absolutely be a barrier. Um, but I'll also say that can be a barrier for pretty much anyone. I remember going to a, a recovery meeting in high school and my English teacher was there and that was like, oh, that was a shock. So um, right, point is being regardless, you're gonna find folks. Um, but I, I think that, especially in talking about a small community with something as serious as, Right, you talk about alcohol use, the opiate epidemic that has completely just really torn apart communities that, um, you know, I've been impressed at how much communities rally together in support of, of the recovery services. Just people who will really stand up and say, you know, we need this in our community, so. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, this one is, uh, probably for you, Liza, as well, but um, it's actually addressed to the whole panel. So curious what everyone would have to say about this. How much recovery time and or recovery capital do you think is important for a person to obtain prior to being a peer recovery specialist? Given the four to five episodes of care and the five years of recovery before a large percent is con continuing their recovery, how do we create a quote standard in the field as all states have different metrics for this criteria? I can touch on this first. Um, I guess. So I believe there, there are different measures for recovery codes versus emergency department peer recovery coaching. I think it's somewhere to the three to five years. I really think that that is, um, I, I believe there should be some type of measure, right? But the, um, someone can be sober for for three years and maybe not necessarily bring the experience that can really be valued in the team setting around recovery. That being said, I think if you have one day sober, you're able to help another, you know, another person seeking recovery because you have one, one more day sober than that and you're able to help, right? But um, I think, I, I know there's been a recent certification of recovery coaches that statewide, a lot of recovery coaches in Vermont have been asked to participate in. And, and, and I believe that's three years of, of recovery. And I, for me, more importantly than the, the quantity of time that you have, it's um, Dr. Dutman touched on the supervision that you have as a recovery coach. And I think that is, um, that's a, a much bigger piece that um, you're getting supervised by a recovery coach coordinator or your team lead, whoever it is, and that you're, engaged with the recovery center. Yeah, excellent points. Do, do Dr. Detman or Dr. Kelly have responses to that question? Yeah, I, I'll just add a little bit. I, I um, agree totally with Liza. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, it's coming up with kind of a, a kind of a, a benchmark time period that would make sense as a, as a kind of from a quantitative aspect. But uh, I agree with Liza, you know, it's really about the quality, isn't it, about somebody's recovery. That's a bit harder to gauge um, when you're, um, you know, interviewing people. I, th I think, you know, two, two to three years is a, is a good benchmark in general. Uh, we do know, just statistically speaking, that, you know, the, the chances of, 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 of relapse after, after three years is only about 30%. Um, so... Most people have about 70% chance of continuing to five years um, if they have three years. Um, the other thing to remember is that actually working in the field protects people from relapse. So it actually is an asset. It's a strengthener, as Liza nicely pointed out in her own experience, just what an asset that is to keeping things front and center, um, 
to, you know, it's a cornerstone, of course, of mutual aid groups. Many of them started by virtue of the same, you know, giving it away to keep it, the idea of I'm helping somebody else, I'm helping myself. Uh, that's a cornerstone, of course, of mutual help, uh, particularly 12-step. Um, and I would argue that what we know about from the data regarding helping others, it does actually help yourself. It, it bolsters your own recovery. Just one final thing I'll say is that um, it's very important, I think, in, in supervisory models for recovery coaches to make it very clear that, um, that as a person in recovery, you're still susceptible to relapse. Even after five years, it's not zero. It's never zero. Uh, it's, it's below 15%. And to make it clear um, that if people are um, experiencing difficulties either um, in, you know, non-using symptoms or, or, or having struggles in their, in their own recovery, their own life, to be able to talk about that, even if they start using, if they're an abstinence-based recovery, for example, and they begin using again, uh, to be able to talk about that. And I think that's very important. We had a recovery coach, for example, who did actually um, have a recurrence uh, during the time they were a recovery coach, but felt very ashamed. And it's more difficult for people who are working in a service position to be able to admit that when they have a, and I think so it's making the culture very open uh, and acceptable for people to talk about that if they do encounter a recurrence of symptoms in their own recovery, uh, to make that very clear in our recovery coaching models. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to turn it over to Nelly for, Nelly, you wanted to launch an evaluation. And afterwards, um, if people want to stay on and our speakers can stay on for a couple more questions, we could do that as well. Um, but let me hand it over to Nellie. Thank you, Jenny. Just a few things to go over. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us today. I am launching a poll now. If you could take a, about one minute to fill it out before logging off, that would be appreciated. Um, if there are any questions that we weren't able to address, we will do our best to follow up with you via email. I'm just going to share briefly. Um, there are continuing education credits for today's community rounds um, in our follow-up email, which will contain the slides, recording, and papers that Dr. Kelly mentioned today. Um, there will be a link for how to claim those credits. If you have trouble with that, feel free to reach out to us at cora.uvm.edu. Um, and we just want to announce our next event as part of the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health's ninth annual conference. We'll be offering a lunch and learn on rural vaping and tobacco use prevalence considerations and interventions on October 8th from noon to 1 p.m. And registration is now live. You can go to go.uvm.edu slash vcbh9. As always, if you have any further questions um, or comments for our presenters that we don't get to today, feel free to contact us at cora at uvm.edu. And thank you for joining. I'll hand it back to Jenny for a few more questions if people have time to stay on. Um, yes, if our presenters want to stay on for another minute or two, um, let me see. I know that I had a good one here for Liza. Um, let me find it. Forgive me. A lot of open things here. Okay. Um, one person asked, does training to be a recovery coach support an individual's recovery journey? Do people with uh, substance use disorder use recovery coaching as part of their personal support path? And actually, I think that question was kind of answered. Um, Liza, do you have anything more to say about that or should we move on? No, I think that's fine to, to move on. It's, it's definitely an, abs, an asset to your recovery. Yeah, okay. Oh, I know, the, here's a good one that, that maybe all of our speakers could, um, could ask, could speak about. 
How do we envision payment for this work with insurances? I am a recovery coach and moving towards becoming a, a CRSW in New Hampshire. I work in the primary care setting and, off, and offer an MAT clinic. Does anybody have? Well, I can touch on what we're trying to do uh, in Vermont um, in our in, in central Vermont in our little tiny area. Um, we actually just had a conversation with the folks from Blue Cross Blue Shield about our um, our um, refocus on alcohol dependence program that we're launching that involves our peer recovery coaches, and they're they're going to be working with us to develop a. Um, bundle payment. And I think this Medicaid, the state level and Medicare could do the same thing. Um, and what they're gonna be looking to do, so for instance, our addiction medicine clinic, where we, which will act as our hub for the patients that we refer from the emergency department, ultimately from primary care, will um, contract with the recovery center. Um, and, and that payment to the recovery center will be recovered um, through the bundle payment model. Um, that's the idea. How robust that is remains to be seen, but um, I see that as a as probably the path forward, at least in Vermont's payer system um, ecosystem. And I think what is one indir slightly indirect answer to that is that I think as, 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 as we've seen in other recovery support service infrastructures, including mutual health groups and recovery housing, these things are very cost effective. So um, I think if we can show that with recovery coaching and peer recovery support centers as well, which I believe I would strongly think that we will show that, that will be shown that these are very cost-effective uh, public health infrastructures, um, it, it'll be a no-brainer that this should be, these should be covered. Um, and so you know, we've got good evidence from other areas. I think it'll be forthcoming in these areas too. Uh, that will support these models um, because they're going to be very, I, I would bet that they'll be very highly cost effective. I would as well that there's been a lot more discussion recently in Vermont about the profession of recovery service and profession of recovery coaches. And most of these positions are offered part time. And for folks who, you know, really carving a career out of this and profession and being able to have adequate payment for that, right? Not just part-time position, added benefits, security, that most of these, most of the payments for recovery coaching are offered through grants and, right, for someone that, for anyone that may not feel the most secure. So having more of a focus and, and discussion around, um, around just, yeah, the payment for that. And, um, and also I think being able to, I saw a question about billing and, and Medicaid recipients. And right now, I, at least to my knowledge, we're not able to do that. So to have a recovery coach connected with the mental health agency and being able to bill for recovery coaching services would be really important as well. Thank you. Um... I, I'm doing my best to keep up with the questions in the different places, um, but I, I do have one here that's addressed to Dr. Kelly. Um, this person asks, one of the essential elements of the couple's behavioral substance use treatment model is having the daily support conversation in the model between the person in recovery and the significant other. Do you know of any recovery center that has adopted the daily conversation between a PSS and a participant? Hmm. Interesting. So, so from, in other words, a, a daily conversation with a peer and like a peer support specialist and, um, and a recovery as it were, I don't, but that's a good idea. Um, especially early on, I think it's implicitly done um, in mutual help organizations, but I haven't seen it explicitly prescribed um, within, or at least I don't know of the degree to which that is explicitly done, but it would make good sense to do so, to have a kind of a recovery coach, daily contact, daily check-in, especially early when people are finding their feet um, and getting uh, you know, stable, stabilized in the community. That would be a great idea. Liza? Yeah, so to 
for the emergency department recovery coaching team, we certainly do follow up. And I know in some recovery centers in Vermont as well, there's designated peer support workers that are on each day of the week and they provide telephone recovery support. And what that looks like is a daily call um, for up to as long as they need it. So if that's a little bit of what that would entail. Wonderful. Okay, well, I try to be very observant of time and we are at um, one minute after one o'clock. Um, I want to let the speakers know that we have had so many um, appreciative messages, people who have gotten a lot out of this. Um, there's still a lot of questions. So people have been very engaged and we, we all heartily appreciate the time that you gave um, today. Um, Nellie, did you have any final comments? I don't think so. We'll try our best to follow up with people for lingering questions um, and feel free to email us with any other questions or comments at Cora at uvm.edu. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.